Before taking these notes, please get out a periodic table with the ions on the back. In this unit, we're going to be studying chemical nomenclature of ionic compounds, covalent compounds, acids, and bases. We're going to be focusing on ionic compounds today. And a fancy word for naming compounds is nomenclature. A chemical formula is very important to understand. It tells you the kinds and numbers of atoms in a compound or an element. In any particular formula, there are ratios of atoms to each other. So for example, in the water, there are two H's and one oxygen. So that's a two to one ratio. Every time you change that ratio, you change the compound. So if we had H2O2, which is a one to one ratio of hydrogen to oxygen atoms, we'd have a different compound, which is hydrogen peroxide. These ratios are also known as the mole ratios. We're going to learn a lot more about the mole later on. But right now, just know that those, ex those subscripts also mean ratios of moles. There are lots of types of formulas. The chemical formula just tells you the chemical makeup and can be written different ways, especially for organic compounds. We also have structural formulas. They show you how the atoms are related to each other with chemical bonds. And then we have some other kinds of structural formulas that have show you or electron orbitals or show you also called the ball and stick molecules. We'll be using all of these this year. Before we get into the naming of compounds, we're going to focus on elements for a few minutes. There are some elements that exist as molecules instead of atoms because there's more than one atom connected together. A real big important one is carbon. There are several different types of carbon or allotropes of carbon that have different amounts of carbon atoms bonded together. Some other ones would be phosphorus and sulfur. So, for example, for phosphorus, it's not, just pho it's not just P, it's P4 because there are four phosphorus atoms together. And same thing for sulfur. You don't need to memorize the carbon, phosphorus, or sulfur examples. You will need to memorize these diatomic molecules. There are seven. It's a good thing to highlight or uh, um, mark these on your periodic table. Another way to remember these is to go to the seven, which would be nitrogen, make a seven, and don't forget hydrogen so you have all seven. So in some way, shape, or form, you need to memorize these. If you're visual, you may want to color them. Another way to remember these is a mnemonic Brinkelhoff. And that's just all the chemical formulas squished together to make a funny name. So some people remember Brinkelhoff, and some remember the shape of where the atoms are on the periodic table. These diatomic molecules exist as a pair, so you would write this as N2, and that's what a particulate theory model would look like. Now we're going to focus on ionic compounds. So the first thing is to talk about ions. An ion is an atom or a group of, ad a group of atoms, like almost like a molecule, that have lost or gained electrons which gives it a positive or negative charge. If you take away an electron from an atom, you're going to get a positive charge, which is going to be called a cation and occurs for metals. For example, if we have a, the metal lithium, we take away an electron, we'll have plus one charge. If we add an electron to a not typically a nonmetal, you're going to be create an anion and get a negative charge. And here are examples: so sulfur, add two electrons, yield sulfide. Ionic compounds occur when electrons transfer from the metal to the nonmetal, which creates the cation and anions. The net charge in the compound, though, was going to be zero. So when we add up the charges of the cation and we add up the charges of the anion all together, we should have a net zero charge. 
Ionic compounds will form a crystal lattice because of the positive and negative charged ions. This is an example of ammonium chloride. You can see the NH4+, which is a polyatomic ion, and the chloride ion, which is the yellow circle. Those are two ions that are inter interspersed through here, positive, negative, positive, negative, and that's why it's called a lattice. You're going to need to know the charges of common ions. So you'll need to know that everybody in group 1 has a plus 1 charge. Everybody in group 2, plus 2. Aluminum is plus 3. Nitrogen family is minus 3. The oxygen family is minus 2. And the halogens is minus 1. Typically hydrogen is going to have a positive 1 charge. There are times when it's when the hydrogen is bonded with a metal, like lithium or sodium, that it would be an H-1 called a hydride. We typically don't have that many kinds of um, compounds with that charge, but hydrogen could have negative 1 on special occasions, but almost always is going to be plus 1. Take a moment to label your periodic table with the plus 1, plus 2, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1 charges. When these ions form, it's due to the octet rule. The ions are becoming like the noble gases in the last column. The transition metals, which we also call the D block, have various m oxidation numbers or charges that they may possess. They're going to be positive pretty much all the time, and we're going to use Roman numerals to figure out what charge they have. There are three there that you need to memorize that always have the same charge, and that's silver, cadmium, and zinc. So you'll need to memorize those three. The last thing we'll talk about before we get started are the polyatomic ions. You can find a list of those on the back of the periodic table I gave you at the beginning of the year. They're also in the list that you had for your summer assignment. You need to memorize the names and formulas of the polyatomic ions, including the charges. So just practice naming the following ions. So take a few minutes to look up the names of these various ions from your periodic table, either the front or the back, and then check with me. Looking through the names, if it's a cation on the front of the periodic table, such as aluminum or calcium, you just call the ion by its normal name. If it is an ion from the right-hand side of the periodic table, a non-metal, it's going to have an IDE ending, like oxide or fluoride. If it is a transition metal, like nickel or iron, the charge is indicated by the Roman numeral, so it's nickel 2 and iron 3. And then of course my polyatomic ions, the nitrate and hydroxide, were on the back of the periodic table. This time I want you to write the formulas for the following ions. So pause the video, look up the different formulas and write them down. And then you'll check your answers on the next slide. So you can see for these answers here, it's very important when you write a polyatomic ion that you know that the 4 is a subscript next to the O and the charge at the top right is separate. It's a superscript. So there are, it's not a 4 minus, there's not 3 oxygen. You have to keep those numbers very specifically straight. The Roman numeral is a charge for a transition metal. And if it has the IDE ending, it's one of the ions on the front of the periodic table, except for hydroxide and cyanide. If it has an ATE or ITE ending, those are indicative of polyatomic ions on the back of the list.
When we're going to write formulas for ionic compounds, you'll be given the names such as lithium oxide. And the first step you'll need to do is to write the formula for the cation and anion. So I know lithium is a metal in group one, the alkali metals. So I'm going to write a plus one. I know oxide tells me that that is the oxygen ion or the oxide ion. So I do O2 minus. The next step is to crisscross the charges. The purpose of the crisscross is to make sure that we have a neutral compound, that when I add up all the charges, it does equal zero at the end. The crisscross charges just means that I'm going to literally swap the charges. They're going to, become, they're going to be, go from superscripts to subscripts of the opposite ion. Don't show ones and don't show ion charges. So this would be Li, the little 2, and O. So lithium oxide is Li2O. There's, an, there's a 1 there at the bottom of the oxygen, but we don't show the 1. If I have two ions with equal but opposite charges, I'm going to cancel them out because I only need one of each to get it to be a neutral molecule or form a unit. So calcium oxide is not Ca2O2. If I can reduce those, I can divide them both by two, I'm just going to put the two ions together for calcium oxide. If I have a Roman numeral, it just tells me the charge of the transition metal. It's kind of nice because if you know the chemical symbol, you don't have to look to see where it is to know what the charge is. So iron 3 just means that that cation has a plus 3 charge. Chloride, I know, is on the top right of the periodic table, and it has a negative 1 charge. So I'm going to crisscross those charges. So that would be FeCl with a little 3. So again, the charges become, if I go from superscripts to subscripts of the opposite ion, and I don't show any 1s, and I don't show the positive or negatives. The last example is for calcium nitrate. This is when I have a polyatomic ion. I know that nitrate is a polyatomic ion because of the ATE. The ATE or IT ending tells me that that ion is on the back of my periodic table. It is coming from a polyatomic and not from an, a monatomic ion. I know that calcium has a plus two charge because it's in group two. When I look up nitrate, it's NO3 with a minus one charge. By the way, it's okay to do a plus or a one plus or a plus one. Those are all mean the same thing for me. There are some differences between these two here, but we're not going to be that picky. Back to the problem. So when I crisscross these, the two is going to go on the outside of the nitrate and the one's going to go on the outside of the calcium. So for this to be correct, I need to show that there's one calcium and two nitrate ions. So that two needs to go on the outside. So I put NO3 on the, on the inside parentheses. So NO6 is wrong, NO5 is wrong, N2O6 is wrong. It needs to be a 2 on the outside. When we're going from the name to the formula, if we have copper bromide, the cops, if it's a metal that's not a transition metal in the middle section of the periodic table, I don't need a Roman numeral, but copper is in that section. So I'm going to call it copper 2 because there's a 2 as a charge. And then Br is bromine, but because it's in a chemical formula, it's an ion, I will say bromide. So that's copper 2 bromide. Just some vocabulary, a binary ionic compound is just when you have a single monatomic cation and an anion, so no polyatomic ions are present. Let me see a bunch of examples there. There's one of each, there's two elements only, another way to think, look at that. It's a metal and a nonmetal, and that's it.